poultry uh, is the number one consumed uh, protein in the U.S. Um, and so gut health is really critical to helping that bird um, not only maintain welfare, but to be as efficient as possible. Hello, everyone. My name is Doug Corver. I'm one of the hosts of the Poultry Podcast Show. Uh, if you find this interview interesting, please let us know by visiting our website at wisenetics.com. You can also learn more about all our podcast segments covering poultry, swine, dairy, beef, feed milling, and pet food. Also, you can feel free to suggest a new guest for us as well. Our guest today is Dr. Tricia Marsh Johnson, who is the Poultry Technical Services Manager at Eastman. Welcome to the program, Tricia. Thank you so much, Doug. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about your role at Eastman? Um, Eastman is a longstanding uh, chemical company. We had our 100th anniversary um, in 19, uh, we started in 1920, had our 100th anniversary in uh, 2020, um, but yet they're new to animal nutrition. So I am the first technical services manager in poultry um, at Eastman for animal nutrition. And my job is to... Uh, help establish our new portfolio um, in the U.S. and establish Eastman as a presence with uh, poultry integrators. Great. So lots of new ground to break for you. Yes, sir. So how did you get to your current position at Eastman? What was your career path to this point? Um, well, I, I uh, am a poultry veterinarian. I uh, went to veterinary school in Oklahoma, at Oklahoma State, uh, thought I was going to do feedlot medicine and realized that production management medicine rarely occurred at that point in time in feedlots. It only occurred in feathered ones. So um, I did my poultry residency, um, at my MAM at the University of Georgia. Um, and so my first job out of the MAM uh, was also with a startup that was new to agriculture. I got handled um, a, a chemical, a bottle of sodium bisulfate and told that, uh, which is a mineral acid salt and got told that, uh, we know that it kills bacteria in the lab and we know it binds ammonia. Go figure out how to make this work in a chicken house. So it was, um, a completely new, uh, product niche up to that point. Litter amendments did not exist. Um, in the poultry industry, now you'd have be hard pressed to find a broiler in the U S that wasn't placed on one. And so that skill set of um, being able to take some novel chemistries and turn those into viable products and kind of do some paradigm shifting in terms of customers um, in the U.S., uh, that experience with mineral acids, um, experience with launching uh, water-delivered products. We also were one of the first... Um, branded uh, water acidifiers for poultry. Um, so all of that experience translated really well to Eastman when they were looking to to start in the U.S. You know, if you if you do technical services um, in poultry in the U.S., it really doesn't it really doesn't matter whose name is on your shirt. Um, you're calling on the same, you know, 15, 20 customers. Um Folks that you have known, that I've known, you know, I've been doing this for 27 years. Um, so you develop deep relationships. There's a deep trust between yourself and the customer. Um, and so that was the sort of thing Eastman was looking for when they were looking to get into the animal nutrition, get into the poultry space specifically uh, in the United States. Eastman serves veterinarians and nutritionists in agrochemical and animal health industries by helping them select, evaluate, and implement innovative nutritional programs. Eastman works with your team to customize your gut health approach in feed and water. Eastman's approach addresses nutritional and bacterial challenges and finds new ingredient preservation and hygiene solutions. Explore ways to accelerate and innovate your programs. Contact the animal nutrition team at eastman.com. So uh, a lot of your focus seems to be on, on gut health. So why is gut health so important for the poultry industry? Well, of course, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm, I may be a little bit different of some poultry veterinarians and that I think that um, feed conversion is the number one indicator uh, of animal welfare um, and gut health is integral to appropriate feed conversion. So that is what keeps us uh, as an industry um, able to produce inexpensive protein that um you know, feeds a good portion of America. Poultry uh, is the number one consumed uh, protein in the U.S. 
Um, and so gut health is really critical to helping that bird um, not only maintain welfare, but to be as efficient as possible. So obviously we're in an environment where uh, the industry is moving away from uh, in-feed antibiotics, uh, gro antibiotic growth motors. Um, what are some of the challenges that that creates for the producer, uh, you know, particularly in the context, as you mentioned, of feed conversion uh, ratio and, and welfare? Very difficult. And actually, you know, we're seeing the pendulum sort of swing back more towards the middle as as producers and integrators have been struggling with that. You know, really early on, um, I, I had a consulting practice for 15 years and I the last um, several years of my consulting practice were spent helping poultry integrators transition to antibiotic free because it is very difficult. Um, we use mostly ionophore antibiotics had been historically what was used in poultry. And those really are anti-parasitic medications. Mm -hmm. They, they're not antimicrobials. People don't understand that all antibi an antibiotic means that it's produced, um, through the natural fermentation process uh, or the natural bacterial processes, it's produced by a bacterial organism. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's antimicrobial. Um, we have chemotherapeutic agents that are antibiotics, for example, but you would never use them to treat an infection. And so when um, everyone switched somewhat abruptly uh, in that 2016, 2017 timeframe, um, it was very difficult as a poultry grower if you were dealing with necrotic enteritis for the first time, where you might be losing three or 400 birds a day for a week to 10 days, that was more than your entire mortality sometimes for an entire flock. And so it was extremely difficult um, of a transition. You know, now I think we've come to a place after, you know, five or six years of working through this, we've developed a level of homeostasis in most complexes. Um, gut health has really improved. Um, but we're also seeing people shifting back towards um, what I refer to more as the McDonald's model, where it's it's focusing on um, not using antibacterials or antimicrobials that are important for human medicine, which mm -hmm. allows for the use of ionophores, which are so important for animal welfare. So, you know, we are seeing that pendulum kind of swing back more towards um, – more towards a happy medium where you're meeting consumer demand, you're protecting public health, you're protecting human health, but also at the same time, um, protecting animal welfare, which in turn protects your feed efficiencies, in turn perfect, in, in, um, protects the livelihood of, of poultry growers and protects the livelihood of poultry integrators. So in terms of the disease challenges that you see coming up when, when antibiotics are removed? What are some of the big ones that uh, the industry is facing right now? Uh, the biggest thing I think we have seen has been um, a dramatic increase in intercoccus septicemia and some really strange hatchery-acquired infections. We're starting to see Clostridium perfringens um, in day-old birds, uh, where, you, where you see birds with... Um, with, you know, bubbly abdomens and things that you would have never seen. You're seeing switching from Enterococcus saccorum into Enterococcus um, facium and fecalis, seeing this like fulminating septicemia um, in birds in a way that uh, we really have not seen before. So that is probably the biggest, uh, I think, sort of universal health challenge or more widely geographically spread health challenge that we're dealing with in poultry. Um and it's one that so far has been very difficult um, with the tools that we have available to impact. So what are some of the limitations in finding effective alternatives to, to antibiotics? Um, I think the bigger thing is that uh, a lot of it goes back to um, where are these bacteria in the birds to begin with? Not only where are these bacteria in the bird, but also what makes the birds susceptible to them. There's sort of a combination of things. And so one of the things that you get with um, the use of ionophores, for example, not only did that help with controlling coccidiosis, but it also helped with controlling inflammation in the bird. And so a lot of times when we look at certain bacterial infections, if inf there, there, something has to start in the bird first for the bird then to become 
susceptible. And so inflammation, um, whether that's inflammation in the gut or inflammation systemically, makes a bird um, susceptible to certain types of bacterial infections. Clostridium perfringens and necrotic enteritis is a perfect example of that. But even I think with enterococcus, we see that as well, particularly with the classic enterococcus where you have um, a lot of inflammation, a certain vertebral joint, and the bacteria will tend to settle out into that inflamed area. Um, So the other component is that a lot of our alternatives um, to go after the bacteria directly, we can't get the um, we can't get the active ingredient to the site of the infection because they just stay inside the gut. They're not able to get systemic into the bird in high enough concentrations to go directly at the organism. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are two of the things that we really struggle with, and I, and I think that is why we're shifting now more towards those indirect effects. How can we make the bird less susceptible to an infection because it's more difficult to go at the infection directly? Right. So, so, uh, it seems like maybe, um, in some cases, particularly with those resistant, uh, uh, back or those bacteria that are hiding in difficult to get, uh, places, um, we, we maybe have benefited in the past from the drug effect of, of antibiotics and, and we're losing that with uh, um, any of the alternatives. Would that be accurate? I do. I do think that's an appropriate thing. I think that a lot of these, um, a lot of these molecules have multiple effects on a bird and the direct antimicrobial effect was, um, was only a small portion of what they actually did. And I, and I think we've looked at them too narrowly. Um, mm-hmm. And having lost some of those, um, the sort of you know indirect or or, or non-specific impacts on uh, immune function and inflammation really have been to our detriment. Right. So when you when you go to a new farm and, and they're facing some maybe non-specific challenges or, or initially non-specific challenges, what are the kinds of things that you're looking for as a veterinarian to um, to identify what the specific problem is and then come up with a solution? Well, I think one of the things more importantly is to really listen to um, really listen to the folks on the ground to, to what are they dealing with? What does it look like? Why, what is it about that particular issue that's concerning them? Is it mortality? Is it weight loss? Is it feed conversion? Um, and then sometimes... Customers might have, they ask for X solution, but it takes a little bit of uh, interview skills, if you will, to pull out of them exactly what they're looking for in the problem to solve the problem, exactly what is it that they need to fix. And sometimes you find that what they're asking for isn't really going to meet the objective that they have. So there's a lot of that that goes on. The other component is that um, husbandry is a huge, huge thing. So even if we don't have something to go at a problem directly, a lot of times we talked about how what is inside the bird that can set them up to having infections or or other types of health problems. But a lot of times that's external to the bird as well. Um, And so I like, I I don't do a lot of posting sessions. I rarely look at dead birds. There's a, there's a huge place for that. And I don't want to discount that value, but most of what I do is I'll go with customers and we'll just start walking chicken houses, looking at birds, getting a sense for what's going on in the house from a husbandry perspective, what's really going on in, in, um, house preparation and brooding, you know, uh, brooding configuration, the types of brooders that they have, the way that they're hung in a house, the heating patterns that you get, the way that the house is um, preheated has a huge, huge impact on um, relative humidity right at the air litter interface, which has a huge impact on gut ecology. What grows in the litter is what grows in the gut. Um, And sometimes just by making some really small husbandry changes, some really small changes to the way houses are set up for brooding, can really make your gut health problem go away at times. You know, obviously if there's a huge coxie problem, that's not the case, but, but all of those things play together. Um, and so it's really more about going in and just really listening to your customer, helping them 
with the right questions, helping them really articulate what they're what they're looking for or, or how the problem is occurring. And then just spending a lot of time looking at birds and letting them tell you what they need. So my perception is that uh, as the industry has moved with one degree of success or another away from uh, antibiotics, it's it's created a, a need for um, just overall better management. Is that what you're mm-hmm. seeing in the field as well? Um, absolutely. I, and, and I think part of that is because of the shift away from um, antibiotics. And I think also the part of that, too, is our, our genetics have changed um, tremendously, you know, and so the birds that we have now are just very metabolically active and um, they're a very different bird than we had when we started raising commercially in the 40s and 50s. And so um, they really need and deserve, you know, a level of husbandry and attention um, that makes sure that they have at every moment of the day the right conditions that they need to perf- to perform and to be healthy. They need a little bit more of the kid glove treatment. Absolutely. It's it's like the difference between, uh, you know, having a Formula 500 race car in your garage and and, and having, you know, an old 1960 Chevy. Um, yeah. One just requires a lot more attention. Yeah. And I think the, you know, the, the, the fact that the birds are growing much more quickly, just, you know, there's less time to recover from a particular problem as well. Absolutely. And I think that, and that's really it. I mean, there's there's so much going on in a 24 hour period in that bird's life um, that it's really important to to pay very close attention. It's it's like the difference between having an infant and having a teenager. Um, you know, that infant requires you to be paying attention to it 24 seven, um, where a teenager can have a little more, you know, independence, if you will. So, you know, we we have these birds much uh, in a much uh, younger stage and and they need they just need a lot of attention and they deserve to have that. So I'd I'd like to remind our audience that if you're finding this or or any of our previous uh, interviews worthwhile and informative, please subscribe to the Poultry Podcast Show YouTube channel and you can do that by clicking on the bell icon to receive our notifications. Also, please share this video if you learned something uh, something new today. So Tricia, what are some of the projects or initiatives that you're currently working on? Eastman, as I said, is just starting in animal nutrition um, in the U.S. And so like a lot of feed additive companies, these portfolios have been utilized in Europe. Um, But as I like to tell folks, the only sort of common denominator between European poultry production and the U.S. poultry production is that the birds still have feathers. Um, And so a lot of what I have been working on is... um, trying to, uh, with our R&D team, um, uh, hone the portfolio, hone the chemistry so that it fits U.S. genetics, that it fits U.S. Um, production models and, and our problems, which are, which are very, very different. Um, we don't feed as inflammatory of a feed in the U.S., for example. You know, in, in Europe, a lot of weed, a lot of fish meal, you know, it's a fairly inflammatory diet and we don't have that. Um, we have we have uh, different issues. So a lot of it is looking at how do what is needed, what what um, what are the challenges customers are facing today, what type of things that they need to work on, um, and then how Eastman's chemistry can fit in with that. Um, we talked about inflammation, uh, and I think that inflammation is something that every bird has to deal with, whether. It's the inflammation from coxycycling. Um, You know, that's why we spend so much time looking at uh, microscopic maxima cycling, for example, you know, when birds are two, three weeks of age, because that inflammation from that really um, robs you of uniformity and feed conversion. You know, looking at um, inflammation from respiratory vaccine reactions, inflammation from, you know, feed ingredients, whether that's from soybean meal that's a little overcooked or, you know, those sorts of things. And so um, we've got a couple of molecules that are uh, very good systemic anti-inflammatory molecules. And so a lot of what I'm doing is taking it from what we've done in our in vivo or in vitro screening and then putting that into birds in the field um, and Mm -hmm. seeing how that's going to work and how do we refine that process um, to make our U.S. producers more successful. 
what what specifically are some of the uh, the molecules that you're working with? Um, one of the things that I find really interesting um, is monobutyrin. So hmm. we're really used to um, butyric salts in the U.S. You know whether that's calcium butyrate or sodium butyrate. There's a variety of products out there, coated, uncoated. But when you take that butyric acid molecule and you put a glycerol on that and turn that into a monoglyceride um, in the form of monobutyrin, it really changes the way it moves in the bird. Um, hmm. So it becomes water soluble, which is, and so you're going to get that product that's going to go all the way and be absorbed into portal circulation really super quickly. So um, very quickly, then you get that monobutyrin in the whole bird, um, and it attaches to uh, a lot of the fatty acid receptors that are um, really present throughout the bird um, in uh, immune cells, in in the liver, in the testes, et cetera. And in human medicine, um, they are using that uh, as an anti-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory particularly for um, liver injuries. And so it's just been really interesting to me seeing how that simple change in form and that simple change in solubility um, really makes it a completely different molecule from from a pharmacology perspective. So that's been really, um, really interesting for me. There's a couple of things that I, that, you know, we really want to take a look at, um, have how they're using these things in human medicine and how that may be able to apply to poultry. Well, as, as a nutritionist, when I think of, of butyrate, you know, typically I'm, I'm thinking about the effect at the level of the gut, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and many of the, the effects that it has uh, on, on the, uh, the microbiome on, uh, enterocytes and, and on, on the gut environment. But it sounds like this uh, uh, kind of overcomes some of what we talked about earlier, where um, that molecule is now being taken in systemically and not just remaining at the level of the gut. No, exactly. And, and you know, even and even when you look at the, the direct impact on enterocytes and tight junctions, you know, changing that molecule to monobutyrin um, improves your expression of tight junction proteins. Hmm. exponentially compared to just a butyric salt. So um, you're exactly right. I mean, you have some level of luminal activity still there, but being able to get it into the bird um, and impact a wider variety of organs and systems really seems to make um, a significant difference in, how, in, in bird performance under both challenge and not challenge. Because that's always the key, right, as a nutritionist. I mean, we can't feed only 20% of our birds, Right, we have to feed 100% of the birds, and so that I think is a challenge to to all of us as we're moving into this, um, you know, this NAE era of poultry production. Um, is not just what do I need to impact that 20% of my farms, you know, that might be having some gut health issues, but how do I feed all of those birds to improve, you know, improve performance? Um, holistically. And I think that that's something that this change in form and being able to be more systemic, you know, we see that regardless of challenge. Um, are there other products or product lines that you're, you're also working with? Um, Eastman is a, uh, is basic in all of the organic acids with the exception of lactic. Um, lactic is a fermentation product. And so um, there's a wide variety of formic and formic propionic, formic lactic combinations that had been developed um, for use in swine. And so we're also looking at how we can develop some of those mixtures to be more effective in poultry, whether that's, you know, formic blends um, to be used at the very end of feed withdrawal for um, salmonella mitigation going into the plant, or is there a way to uh, to blend these things into water delivered products um, so that you can have more spot specific treatments. Those are all things that, um, that are in development at the moment. So uh, when I talk to producers, one of the things that I, um, I stress in, in dealing with uh, living without growth promoting antibiotics is, is uh, the need for um, different products, different mechanisms of action. Um, and, and sometimes we get synergies. Is, is that the case with the uh, monobutyrin, um, where it has effects just on its own, but it also uh, has synergies with other types of products? 
Um, I think it certainly can. I think most of the synergies that we see between uh, organic acids and monoglycerides actually occur mostly with medium chain um, mm. monoglycerides. And so as you're getting into, uh, you know, your C8s, your C10s, um, there seems to be uh, in the literature, you know, significant synergy there between those. Um, and so those are certainly things that we are that we are pursuing. Um the, the medium chain fatty acids are also really interesting um, because those function as what we, they're referred to as antimicrobial lipids. And so if you have them in sufficient quantity, and that's really what's important, um, they, they form what's called a micelle. Basically, if you, I, I sort of think about it, it's almost like a kite with a tail. And so what you want is you want them to form a circle, but with all the tails of the kite pointing into the middle. Um, mm. And that allows it to almost act like a soap molecule and it sort of, and it dissolves bacterial cell membranes um, and different chain links of fatty acids um, fit better with different, you know, so like a C12, for example, a monolarin fits really nicely with a gram positive cell membrane. Um, C8s and C10s do really well with gram negatives. And so getting those in um, the right blends and in sufficient quantities um, really can improve their function as an antimicrobial lipid. And so that's something I think that um, the animal feed industry is kind of in early days of figuring mm -hmm. out how to, to put those blends together to get uh, maximum efficacy against very specific bacterial targets. So what kind of levels are required in the diet to have these effects? Um, that's one of the things that we're still learning. What you can do, what, what is being going on is that you, you know, is doing a lot of um, basic screening uh, from a chemistry perspective, looking at what's called a, that critical micelle concentration. And a lot of that is done it's really easy to see visually. It's almost like you do almost like a, like a, like an oil slick, if you mm -hmm. will. And looking to see how you can cut through that oil slick. Um, and that's how you kind of figure out that concentration. Um, and I should know these concentrations off the top of my head, but uh, for example, you look at something um, like a monolaurin and changing it from lauric acid into um, a monolaurin monoglyceride changes that level over tenfold, reduces it over tenfold hmm. um, at what's necessary. Now in Europe, they have been feeding these things at uh, some pretty high concentrations, you know, six, eight, 10 pound per ton inclusion rates. Um, and you know, those are the kind of things that are just not going to be, not going to be tenable. Um, mm -hmm in the US. And so a lot of what we're working on now is figuring out are there specific synergies and specific blends, particularly if we combine them with organic acids that can get us to um, same levels of efficacy, but at much lower concentrations to get into, you know, that two, three pound per ton inclusions that, um, that make more sense in the U.S. Yeah, I suspect it's a matter of finding the, the concentration where you see those uh, effects on, on inflammation and, and uh, protection without turning it into a, an energy source for the bird. Well, I mean, I think there's always some level of an energy source there. And I think that's what's nice about um, monoglycerides in general, right? If you so many of the, the novel feed ingredients, feed additives that, that are coming to market, whether, you know, those are phytobiotics or saponins or different things, and they all have, um, have value, but they don't have energy value. They don't bring anything to the diet nutritionally. So there's mm -hmm. nothing to offset the cost of that. Right. Everything that you add is simply a cost to the diet where you can, um, add value to that glycerol component that comes in with monoglycerides and monoglyceride blends. And so it does give you a little bit of fat energy to kind of offset some of those, those calories from, you know, usually you're displacing corn, you know, when mm -hmm. you're, when you're formulating that. So that is something that, um, that does bring a little bit of value. I think the bigger issue is finding, finding those inclusion rates, finding those combinations where, you get the effect, but you can also get your return on your investment, right? At the end of the day, 
when you're dealing with the populations the size that we deal with, it all comes down to fee cost per pound of life. And if you cannot right. improve fee cost per pound of life, well, there you go. You know, you're probably not going to get very far past that. Natural Biologics is using cutting edge science to dig deeper into the poultry health challenges you face. By gathering scientific evidence, they identify the most effective combinations of natural ingredients that improve animal health. Visit naturalbiologics.com slash poultry to see the newest research in both turkeys and chickens. Tricia, what do you think the future holds for, for the industry and the, the challenges that are coming? What, what should producers and technical service people focus on? You know, I think, you know, and I'm, I'm a little biased here just from, you know, my experience. Uh, oh, you know, my preference is always to be in a house looking at birds, you know, but as we're getting um, the same type of labor challenges, you know, that other industries are dealing with, um, as our birds are becoming um, more fine-tuned um, in in uh, their growth habits, um, we really need to be, I think husbandry is really still going to continue to be a challenge for the industry. Our husbandry is good. I, I don't want to give anyone the impression that... Um, that our growers are not doing a good job raising birds because they are. Um, mm -hmm. It's just that we keep getting better and better, you know, as an old 4-H kid, you know, to make the best better. And I think back to where we were when I started. Um, a lot of curtain-sided houses uh, only had forced air heaters for brooding. You know, when you look back at... Um, the mortality rates and some different things that we had then, those are such a distant memory to today's industry. We really are fine tuning and fine tuning and fine tuning. Um, and so I think that's going to continue to be a challenge. We're seeing a lot of people retiring. Um, it, it's amazing to me to go and see a 23 year old complex manager. Um, and so being able to, pass on what I refer to as chicken knowledge, you know, where there's an art to this. It's not all numbers on a page. There's a real art to watching birds and responding and giving them what they need and being able to transfer that knowledge to the next generation of growers, the next generation of live production personnel. Um, I think that is something we're going to struggle with as an industry because you can't, replace that people knowledge. No, nothing that you put in your feed, no vaccination program, no coccidiosis control program is ever going to replace that. So you mentioned turnover in, uh, in the industry. If, if you were gonna, going to give some advice to someone just entering a, a technical service role in the poultry industry, what, what do you think they should be looking for, skills that they should develop? You know, I think one of those things is as you're going through school, as you're going through your training, spend as much time as you possibly can actually working with live production people, actually spending time in a chicken house. Um, understand how to look at things through their eyes. Uh, spend time learning about all of the pieces that they have to balance, all of the, the things, the metrics that are important to them, important to them in doing their job. Um, so much of what of what we learn sometimes can be sort of divorced from the practical application of it. And so I think the more time that you spend um, working in that, the better. The more time you learn the right questions to ask, um, the more time you spend with chicken litter under your feet, the more you can see trends and patterns. And, you know, when it comes to the poultry industry, by the time something's published or something's in a textbook, our industry's moved on. Um, and so really the more um, practical, on the ground experience and knowledge that you can get, the better. That's important advice for anyone. So is there a topic that we haven't covered that uh, you'd like to talk about? Not anything that I can think of off the top of my head. I just, you know, I used to talk about, you know, words of wisdom or words of advice. I think about... Um, if I'm doing training with live production personnel or with growers, you know, there's always two slides that I always have. It doesn't really matter what what topic I'm talking about. And the first one always is um, 
your chickens always have veto power over your controller. You yeah, know, I, so I, many times we have people say, well, you know, but my controller is at set point or, but, you know, my feed balance is out properly in the formulation software or, you know, my vaccination program should be okay. Um, make, you know, listen to your birds, believe what your birds are telling you. Sometimes um, our equipment and our, our uh, calculations, they might be correct. Maybe the bird really needs something different. And then the other, the other thing that I have is, um, you know, along that same lines, always believe your birds before you believe your equipment. And I think that that really goes a long way. Um, you know, value the people that are in the field all the time, value their observations, um, value their insights, because without that, that's when you miss something really important. And that's when you miss that new thing, that novel thing, that's a paradigm shift that you weren't expecting to see. Well, Tricia Mars Johnson, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you so much, Doug. I really appreciate the opportunity. And thank you also to our audience. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a thumbs up on the platform you're using uh, to view or to listen. I'm Doug Corver, and I'll see you next time on the Poultry Podcast Show.